Welcome back to Physical Science 101. In this lesson, we're going to start Unit 3, and the topic of Unit 3 is energy. We've talked about forces and motion so far, but we're going to bring them together into the idea of energy. Now, the idea of energy is a very powerful idea in science. Uh, scientists use energy to explain and predict, and also, energy is a commodity. Energy is bought and sold, so as I say it, energy is money. Let's get started. Let's take a look at the topics in this unit. First, we're going to talk about mechanical energy. Mechanical energy is kinetic energy or potential energy. And then there's the idea of work, which is a transfer of energy. We'll also talk about simple machines. We'll bring, we'll bring kinetic energy, potential energy, and work together in the energy principle. And that's going to be our big working idea. And with the energy principle, we're going to talk about power. Then we're going to talk about other energy concepts, such as internal energy, conservation of energy, the idea that energy is money. And then we're going to look at the relationship between energy and momentum, which we talked about in the last unit. Okay, the first idea is kinetic energy. You may have heard of kinetic energy as the energy of motion, and that's what it is. Uh, the kinetic energy that an object has depends on the object's speed, and it also depends on the object's mass. So when we bring those together, the equation for kinetic energy is kinetic energy equals one half of an object's mass times its speed squared. So if we put that in our shorthand, Ke for kinetic energy equals one half m for mass times v for speed squared. So that is our kinetic energy. The unit of kinetic energy is a joule. Now if we look at our equation for kinetic energy, we'll see that a joule must be equal to a kilogram for the mass times a meter per second for the speed squared. So one joule is equal to a kilogram times a meter squared per second squared. Remember, we can always bring these units back to kilograms, meters, and seconds, some combination of kilograms, meters, and seconds. So a joule is a kilogram meter squared per second squared. A joule is also a newton meter. Let's take a look at how that is. So we have one joule is equal to one kilogram times a meter squared per second squared. So one joule is one kilogram times a meter per second squared times a meter. So that's our meter squared right there. Now the kilogram times a meter per second, that is also a newton. That was our newton from our force unit. So one joule is also equal to one newton times a meter. And that's going to be important when we talk about work. So a joule is a kilogram times a meter per second squared. Uh, a kilogram times a meter squared per second squared. It's also equal to a newton times a meter. Now another thing that's important here is that energy is not a vector. There's no direction associated with energy. So a joule of energy in one direction is the same as a joule of energy of an object moving in another direction. So let's put that to work. Okay, let's do some calculations with kinetic energy. The first question is, a 150 gram baseball has a speed of 30 meters per second what is the kinetic energy in joules? Now remember that a joule is a kilogram times a meter squared per second squared. So you will have to convert 150 grams into kilograms before you calculate kinetic energy. Now at this time, I'd like you to pause, work through that, and come back when you're ready, and I will work through it with you.
Okay, so we have a baseball with a mass of 150 grams and it's moving at 30 meters per second. Now, as I said, we have to convert those grams into kilograms. So remember, we have grams, we want to get rid of them. So grams goes in the denominator, kilograms goes in the numerator, and then we have to have the same thing on the top and the bottom, and that would be one kilogram is 1,000 grams. So our grams will cancel out, and we have 150 times one divided by 1,000, that will be 0 0.150 kilograms. Now, a kinetic, uh, now kinetic energy, our, our equation is, in shorthand, kinetic energy is one-half the mass times the speed squared. So kinetic energy is one-half of 0 0.150 kilograms times 30 meters per second squared. So kinetic energy is, well, it's one-half, one-half times 0 0.150 times 30 squared one-half times 0 0.150 times 30 squared, and what you should get is 67.5, and then we have kilograms meters squared per second squared, so that would be a joule. So the kinetic energy of that baseball is 67.5 joules. So a baseball thrown with 30 meters per second has 67.5 joules of kinetic energy. Okay, second question. What is the kinetic energy of a 2,000 kilogram car moving at 72 kilometers per hour? Once again, remember that you will have to convert those kilometers per hour into meters per second in order to get your answer in joules. So generally, you should always convert from all the other units that are possible two kilograms, meters, and seconds. Okay, once again, pause, try that, and then come back when you're ready to see me work through it. Okay, here's our car, and it is moving with a speed of 72 kilometers per hour, and it has a mass of 2,000 kilograms. Okay, we have kilograms, but we have kilometers an hour, so that's not meters per second. We have to convert that. So let's do our conversion. We're actually going to have to do two conversions. We want to convert kilometers into meters. So kilometers is in the numerator. So we have to put kilometers in the denominator and meters in the num numerator. And then one kilometer is 1,000 meters. And then we want to convert hours to seconds but hours is in the denominator, so we need to put that in the numerator so that it will cancel out. And we want seconds. So our kilometers cancel out, and one hour is 3,600 seconds. So now our hours cancel out, and we're left with meters and seconds. Okay, and what is that equal to? 72 kilometers per hour, that is 72, so we gotta do our numbers now. 72 times 1,000 divided by 3,600. 
and that would be 20 meters per second. All right, that's everything we need so our, to calculate our kinetic energy. So our kinetic energy is one half of the mass times the speed squared, written in our shorthand. So our kinetic energy is one half of 2,000 kilograms times 20 meters per second, and then we have to square that. So what is our kinetic energy? One half times 2,000 times 20 squared. Our number comes out to be 400,000 kilograms meter squared per second squared, which is a joule. So our baseball had about 67, uh, 67 joules of kinetic energy. A car moving down the highway has 400,000 joules of energy. So you get an idea of how much a joule is. Uh, a baseball has tens of joules. A car has hundreds of thousands of joules of energy to, to move down the, has to have that much energy to move down the highway at 72 meters per, uh, 72 kilometers per hour, which I will say is about, um, about 40 miles an hour. Okay, that's our second question. Okay, for this question, I'm gonna give you the kinetic energy and ask you to calculate the speed. And I will say, this is as complicated as it gets mathematically. So do your best, try, and we will work through this together. So the question is, what is the speed of a 1,000 kilogram car if its kinetic energy is 200 kilojoules? So first thing you're gonna to have to do is convert the kilojoules into joules. Remember, a kilojoule would be a thousand joules. So do your unit conversion, write out your equation for kinetic energy, and then solve it for speed. Okay, try that, pause, try that, and then come back when you're ready to see me work through it. Okay, here's our car. It is a 1,000 kilogram car, kilograms. This time, its speed is unknown, but we do know that its kinetic energy is equal to 200 kilojoules. So the first thing we'll have to do is we'll have to convert kilojoules into joules. Remember, use your parentheses, use your fraction, your conversion fraction. We have kilojoules in the numerator. We want to get rid of those. So we put kilojoules in the denominator and we want to turn that into joules. So we put joules in the numerator. And as I said, one kilojoule is 1,000 joules. So, our kilojoules cancel out, and we have 200 times 1,000, so that is gonna be 200,000, and our only unit left is the joule. So the kinetic energy of that car is 200,000 joules, okay? So let's calculate, let's use our uh, kinetic energy equation to calculate speed. Kinetic energy is 1 half m, v squared. Now what we want to do is we want to get the v by itself. Well, let's just start by getting v squared by itself. Okay, I have a one half. So the way to cancel out a one half is to multiply by two. And remember, when you multiply by two, you have to multiply both sides by two. And I have mass. I want to cancel that out by dividing by mass. I have to divide both sides by mass. So 
2 times a half, or 1 half of 2 is just 1. Those cancel out. Mass over mass is just 1. That cancels out. So what I have left is 2 times my kinetic energy over my mass is equal to my speed squared. Okay, so I have everything over here. I have my kinetic energy and I have my mass. So I can actually go ahead and do my calculations and we'll figure out, we'll calculate what V squared is equal to and then, then we'll take the square root to, uh, to find out what V is. But let's just start by finding, figuring out what V squared is. So 2 times my kinetic energy is 2 times 200,000 joules divided by the mass. The mass is 1,000 kilograms. Okay. And that would be 2, 2 times 200 thousand divided by 1,000, so that would be 400 joules per kilogram. And let me finish my equation, that's equal to V squared, 400 joules per kilogram. And for a joule, I'm going to expand my joule, my joule is a kilogram meter squared per second squared, so that's my joule. It's my joule right there, and I divide by kilogram, and my kilograms cancel out. And you see that my units are meter squared per second squared, which they should be if they're speed squared. Okay, so everything's still good. So we, so we know that the speed squared is 400 meter squared per second squared. So if we want the speed, we'll just have to take the square root. Okay, and the square root of V squared is just my speed. That's what I'm looking for. Nope, not squared. Just my speed. Just my speed. Okay, and that is equal to the square root of 400. The square root of 400 is 20. The square root of a meter squared is a meter, and the square root of a per second squared is a per second. So we see that our speed is equal to 200 meters per second, uh, not 200, 20 meters per second. And that is the speed of that car. And as I said, that's as complicated as it gets mathematically in this course, solving for that square root. So you'll get some more practice, so keep at it, and you can do it. Okay, that's kinetic energy, the energy of motion. Now we're gonna talk about potential energy, the energy of position. And the particular position that we're interested in is an object's height. An object's potential energy depends on how high it is. Doesn't matter on where it is, left or right, but it does, the potential energy does depend on its position up and down. So, the potential energy of an object it's, this is called gravitational potential energy because we're talking about the potential energy due to gravity. The gravitational potential energy of an object is equal to the object's mass. So we have mass in there again, just like we did for kinetic energy. The more of the object that there is, the more mass there is, the more potential energy the object has. So potential energy depends on the object's mass. It depends on gravity. It depends on gravity in the form of the gravitational field, little g. So mass times g, g being 9.81 newtons per kilogram, newtons of weight per kilogram of mass, and then times the height. So, so potential energy depends on the height, that's the position. It's gravitational potential energy, so it depends on G on the gravitational field strength, and it depends on just how much of that object that there is. So gravitational potential energy is equal to mass times G times height. And in our shorthand, PE for potential energy equals M for mass times G for the gravitational field 
times height. And the thing about potential energy is that height can be negative. We define height to be zero wherever it's convenient. Uh, if you you might define the floor where you are to be zero height, but that floor, you might be on the second floor. So what you consider zero height uh, might be a positive height for someone else on the first floor. Uh, what you can define as zero height might actually be a negative height for someone on the third floor. So we're always free to define our zero for our height. So that's where we have zero potential energy for us, but objects can always go below zero height. Uh, for example, if you're on the second floor, you might drop something out of a window and it might go down to, uh, to a negative height. So if an object goes to a negative height, it will actually have a negative potential energy. So potential energy can be negative. Um, depends on where you want to define it. If you define it as the ground, if something falls in a hole in the ground, that would be negative potential energy. Uh, you might, you might define uh, zero height as sea level, but still you can have heights below sea level. So, so your zero of height is arbitrary. It's up to you. But so once you set a zero height, you have to be consistent about it, but then you can have positive potential energy if, if an object is raised up above zero height or a negative potential energy if the object falls below zero height. Okay, so keep that, keep that in mind. Potential energy can be a negative quantity. You can have a negative amount of potential energy if you are below uh, zero height. And that's okay, that's okay. Um, what really matters is, or as you're going to see, what really matters are changes in energy, changes in potential energy is what is physically meaningful to us. Okay, real quick, let's do a calculation using gravitational potential energy. What is the potential energy of a two kilogram book on a shelf that is two meters above the floor? Now there is something about this question that uh, you have to intuit. What did the author mean? The author here is intending for the floor to be zero height, even though the author of this question didn't tell you. And that's something that uh, you will see if you answer more physics questions. I can tell you that when I give you a question, I'll be very specific about what I mean by zero height. But in this case, you have to intuit that the author Im implied that the floor is zero height. Okay, so with the floor is zero height, what is the potential energy of a two kilogram book on a shelf that is two meters above the floor? Okay, pause, work on that, and then come back when you're ready uh, for me to work it. Okay, here's the shelf, here's the floor. I said the height of the floor is zero meters. The book is on the shelf. Book has a height of two meters. And the mass of the book is two kilograms. And the question is, what is the potential energy of that book? Our potential energy, our gravitational potential energy is equal to the book's mass times g times the height of the book. So potential energy is the book's mass, two kilograms, times g, which is 9.81 newtons of weight per kilogram of mass, times a height of two meters, okay? So the potential energy is two times 9.81 times two, 
that would be 39.2. And what about my units? My kilograms cancel out. I have kilograms divided by kilograms, and I have a Newton times a meter. And remember that a Newton times a meter is also a joule. Actually, let me, let me expand that out for you. So it'd be 39.2, a Newton is a kilogram meter per second, and then I have another meet, oh, meter per second squared, sorry. A Newton is a kilogram meter per second squared, and then I have another meter right here. So I have kilogram meter squared per second squared. So my potential energy is 39.2 joules of potential energy, and that is what we were asked. Okay, quick question. A rock on the ground is considered to have zero potential energy. In the bottom of a well, the rock would be considered to have A, zero potential energy as before, B, negative potential energy, C, positive potential energy, or D, zero potential energy, but it re would require work to bring it back to ground level. Now think about this. It's important that you think about it and actually come down on an answer. I want you to, I want you to pick A, B, C, or D and definitely have an idea about which answer you choose and why. Don't just wait for me to tell you the answer. Think about it. Think about it. Come down on an answer. So you can even pause and think about it and then come back when you're ready to hear the answer. Okay, the correct answer here is B, negative potential energy. If the rock on the ground, so let's say this is ground level, if the rock on the ground has zero potential energy, then at the bottom of the well, it would have a lower height. The height at the bottom of the well would be negative. So the potential energy would be the mass of the rock times G, which is a positive number, times a negative height, which would give us a negative potential energy. Gravitation potential energy can be negative, and if you are below zero height, you have, if you are below what you define to be zero height, then you have a negative potential energy. So the correct answer here is B. Okay, the third idea that we need to build our energy principle is the idea of work. Work is a force applied over a distance. So work is force times distance. That's how we calculate work. Work is force done times the distance. Now the important thing is that only distance in the direction of the force counts. Okay, so if you apply a force to an object in the direction that the object moves, then you have done work. Work can also be negative, work can be positive or negative. So if you apply a force in the distance that an object moves, then you have done positive work. If you apply a force opposite the motion, then you have done negative work. Okay, now what work does is that work changes an object's mechanical energy mechanical energy being either kinetic energy or potential energy. So kinetic and potential energy taken together are an object's mechanical energy. So work changes mechanical energy. That is the big idea here. Work done changes mechanical energy. So let me demonstrate that for you. Okay, I have a block here and let's call this zero height. Okay, so, so where the block is now, that level is zero height. Now I am going to raise the block up. I'm going to apply a force to it over a distance. Now and I'm, going to, I'm going to move that block at constant speed. 
So the block will remain in equilibrium. So the force that I apply will be balancing the block's weight. So if you look at my hand, you can see that I am applying an upward force to the block that is balancing the, the block's weight. Now, even as I move it, if I move at a constant speed, remember that an object moving at constant speed in a straight line is in equilibrium. So e even as I move it upwards, my force is still the same as the weight of the block, except in the opposite direction. My upward force is, balance, is balancing the weight of the block. So I have the block here at zero height, and I'm going to raise it up, okay? So what have I done? I have the block at zero height, and I raise it up to another height. And we'll call that, I don't know, uh, a quarter of a meter, 0 0.25 meters. And I've done that by applying an upward force. So that's my force. And the motion, the distance that it moved, has been upwards in that direction. So I am applying a force in the direction that I'm moving it. And so I'm applying the force over a distance of 0 0.25 meters. So my force is in the direction of motion. So I am doing positive work as I lift the block up. I'm applying a force over a distance and force and distance are in the same direction. So I'm raising the block up and so I'm doing positive work on the block. The block has also gained energy, okay? Right here, kinetic energy is zero, potential energy is zero. So there's no, the block has no mechanical energy, zero potential energy, zero kinetic energy. As I raise it up, now the block still has no kinetic energy, but it has gained potential energy, okay? So the block was at height equals zero to begin with. Now it's at a higher height. It's at a height of 0 0.25 meters. So by applying a force over a distance, I have given the block potential energy. So my work has given the block potential energy. Down here, the block has no energy, no potential energy, no kinetic energy. Up here, the block has a potential energy of whatever its mass is times 0 0.25 meters times g, okay? So my force applied over a distance gave that block its energy, my work. So the work is equal to the force times the distance. So that is raising the block, okay? Work is equal to force times distance and it's positive. Now, let's consider what would happen if I lower the block. Okay, so as I lower the block, the block goes from a height of 0 0.25 meters back down to zero. So I am lowering the block. The block is losing its kinetic energy, I mean, losing its potential energy. So it has some potential energy up here. Now, I have somehow taken away that block's potential energy. Now, it has a potential energy of zero again. How did I do that? Well, this time, the block is moving down a distance of 0 0.25 meters. So it's moving down, but look at my hand. The force that I'm applying to this block is still upwards. I am not applying a downward force to this block. As a matter of fact, if I'm moving at a constant speed, then it's in equilibrium, and the force of my hand is still balancing the weight. So I am still applying an upward force to the block as I lower it. So as I lower the block, I'm applying an upward force, but there's negative, the downward motion. So my force and the motion are in opposite directions. So I am doing negative work. My work is negative. negative. 
So as I'm lowering the block, I'm applying an upward force with a downward motion. So I am doing negative work and I am taking away the energy of the block. So my work is negative. So the block has potential energy and now it doesn't. It has, it has potential energy, no kinetic energy. Now it has no potential energy and no kinetic energy. So the block's energy is decreased. It is decreased through the action of my negative work. Okay, I have taken that energy back from the block. I gave it to the block and I took it away from the block. Okay, by doing work, either by doing a positive work to give it potential energy or doing negative work to take away the potential energy. Okay, so that is the big idea of work. Work can give kinetic energy, can give mechanical energy, mechanical energy being kinetic or potential, or it can take away mechanical energy, kinetic or potential. So a couple more examples. Let me raise the block up. So I have the block up here. Now the block has potential energy, um, but this time I'm not going to lower it. I'm just going to drop it. Okay, so as I drop the block, once I let go of the block, the block returns down to here without any work being done. Okay, I'm not doing work on the block as it falls back from here. So its potential energy got converted to kinetic energy. Okay, so as the block fell, without my doing work on it, without my doing work to take that energy away, that potential energy got converted to kinetic energy. The block started moving and uh, the farther it fell, the faster it fell. So the potential energy was converted to kinetic energy, but I didn't do any work. So the mechanical energy of the block didn't change at all, okay? Whatever potential energy it had here was converted to kinetic energy. So the block went from not moving to moving it went from high and not moving to low and moving. So it went from having potential energy to zero potential energy, zero kinetic energy to some kinetic energy. So the kinetic energy that the block gained as it fell came from its potential energy. And the reason it, was, it fell faster and faster is that I did not do work to take away the energy. Okay. Now, when the block gets to my hand, when I drop the block and it reaches my hand, well, what happens to that kinetic energy? That kinetic energy gets taken away. And how did that kinetic energy get taken away? Well, as the block fell, my, I, it fell onto my hand and my hand had to move down just a little bit to take that kinetic energy away. So I had to do negative work to take that kinetic energy away as the block hit my hand. So the block fell, I grabbed it in my hand, my hand went down just a little bit, so I was applying an upward force with a downward motion, so now I'm doing negative energy to take that kinetic energy away. So work is force times distance. A, the, the work is positive if the force is in the same direction as, as the distance. It's negative if the force is opposite the distance. And if I were to move this block sideways, then no work is being done, okay? So if I move the block from here to here, my force is still up. I'm still supporting the weight of the block. So I'm still, I'm still supporting the block with an upward force, but now I'm moving that away. So an upward force and sideways motion then that's neither, that force is neither in the direction of motion or opposite the direction of motion. So that work is zero. So work can be positive, negative, or zero, depending on whether the force is in the direction of motion, opposite the direction of motion, or per perpendicular to the direction of motion. Okay, that is our big idea of work. So one quick question for you. According to the definition of mechanical work, pushing on a rock accomplishes no work unless there is A, movement, B, a net force, 
C, an opposing force, or D, movement in the same direction as the direction of the force. So once again, think about it, come down on an answer, you can pause, and then come back when you're ready to hear the answer, but definitely come down on an answer. It's important that you think about it enough to have an answer. Don't just wait for me to tell you the answer, think about it. Okay, work is force times distance. So mechanical work requires a force and it requires motion, requires a distance. So the correct answer here is D, movement in the same direction as the direction of the force. So for a positive work, you have to have a force and movement in the direction of the force. So for, for positive work to be done, you have to have movement and a force. While we're on the topic of work, let's talk about simple machines, such as a lever, for example. Now, simple machines, when you use a simple machine, the simple machine does not change the amount of work that you do. It just changes the force that you need to do the work. Let's take a look at this lever over here. On the left side of the lever, that would be where you apply your effort. Okay, you would apply a small force over a long distance. So the long lever arm would allow you to apply a small force, but it will require you to apply that force over a long distance. On the right hand side, where the load is, you get a much larger force. So you multiply the force when you use the lever, but that force is only applied over a smaller distance. So on your side, you have a small force and a long distance. And on the other side, you have a much larger force, but a smaller distance. But those two balance when you multiply them together. When you multiply your small force times a big distance, that is the same as the big force on the load side times a small distance. So small force, big distance equals big force times small distance, or in other words, the work done on either side is the same. And they're both positive because you are applying a downward force and a, over a downward distance, and on the other side, you get an upward force over an upward distance. So they're both positive. They're both positive work that you get out of the lever, but you don't get any more work out of the lever than you put in. So you apply a small force, but you have to compensate by applying it over a big distance to get on the other side a big force out, but only a small distance. So if we look at this lady uh, using a jack to lift her car, she has to lift that car. That car weighs 5,000 newtons. There's no way that she can apply that much force. She just doesn't have that much force in her so she uses her jack, which is just a lever, and so she moves that handle, and she moves that handle over a long distance, but with a smaller force. So she can use a smaller force over a long distance to raise the car up, but every time she pumps the handle, the car only goes up a tiny distance. So she has to pump that handle multiple times. She has to do a lot of force times distance to get the car to, to raise its large weight up whatever distance is necessary to get the tire off the ground. So she's using that lever to multiply the force that she applies to the car, but she has to apply it over a much longer distance because the simple machine doesn't multiply her work. It only multiplies her force. So you apply a small force, but over a longer distance, on one side to get out a, a large force, but over a shorter distance. Okay, a pulley is another example of a simple machine that we can use to multiply our force. So we have the, we have the fellow there lifting a weight that he couldn't lift otherwise. 
he couldn't apply that much force to lift that weight. So he rigged up some pulleys and he's using, he's using a small force on the rope to lift that weight up, to, to lift that heavy weight up. But the trade-off is that he has to pull that, that rope a longer distance. He has to pull a lot of rope. So he has to pull over a longer distance to get the weight to rise up a small distance. So that's the trade-off. The simple machine multiplies his force, but at the cost of making him apply that force over a longer distance. So no more work is done. It's just the force is multiplied times the, the force is multiplied on the load side, but the distance is multiplied on the effort side. So, so machines, simple machines do not multiply your work. They just multiply the force, but you have to compensate by applying over a longer distance. Uh, here's a ramp. We have two people lifting up the same load. Uh, now the man on the, on the right, he can apply enough force to lift that load up straight up. Okay. So he's, he's applying a force over a short distance to lift that load up. The lady on the left, uh, maybe can't apply that much force. So what she's going to do is she's going to use the ramp and she's going to have the same result. She's going to do the same amount of work on the weight. She's going to get the weight up just as high, but she's going to use less force to get that weight up. And why is it going to take less force? Well, she's got to push it the longer distance up the ramp. The man can apply a larger force over the shorter distance straight up. The lady can apply a smaller force, but she has to do it over a longer distance. So those are simple machines. Simple machines can multiply your force, but not your work. You still have to apply that force over a longer distance to get the same result. Okay, let's bring all of this together. Kinetic energy, potential energy, and work. Okay, let's bring all of these ideas together kinetic energy, potential energy, and work, and we'll bring them together using the energy principle. So what I've drawn here is I've drawn a box, and that box represents an object. Now that object can have energy. That object can have kinetic energy or potential energy, and its, its kinetic energy can increase or decrease, its potential energy can decrease, increase or decrease. We can also change the overall amount of energy by doing work. So I've drawn work as an arrow bringing energy into that object. That would be positive work. Positive work would put energy into that object. Negative work, that's the arrow leaving the box. Negative work takes energy away from that object. So the box represents the object that contains energy, either potential or kinetic energy or both. And work is a flow of energy into that object. Positive work brings energy into that object. Negative work takes it away. And our energy principle is that whatever increase in energy we have in that box, that increase in energy must come either from work or from a corresponding decrease in another kind of energy. So ener any energy increase must be equal to work bringing energy in or a decrease in another kind of energy. So that is our energy principle. Energy increase equals work plus an energy decrease. Now you should consider work done by all forces except for weight, all forces except for weight, because weight or gravity, gravity is already accounted for by the potential energy. So don't, don't concern yourself with the work done by gravity because that is already accounted for by potential energy. So our energy principle, once again, is any energy increase equals the work done on that object plus any decrease in energy in that object. 
Okay, this is a very, very, very powerful idea that scientists use all the time. It's a very, very powerful idea for prediction and explanation of what's going on. So we will work with this idea next time. So until then, think science.